welcome. My name is Eric Schmeck. I am the manager of the Southern Boone County uh, Public Library. That's where I am right now. I'm in the dark library that closed recently. You might be able to see the dark library through the window there. Um, this program is affiliated with our uh, slate of one read programming, um, in part because it's, you know, the one read book is, at least in part, it's a true crime story. I guess there's some other stuff going on there, too. Um, and so this is our, our attempt to figure out a local true crime story, see what we can confirm about it. Welcome to the program, The Brookshire Murders, Investigating a True Crime in Mid-Missouri. Um, before I get too deep into this, I'm going to try to explain my um, methods and just basically how this, this whole thing is organized. So um, the sources are mostly newspaper articles. I have to have special thanks to my colleague, Tim Dollins, who dug up the vast majority of them. Um, because these are old, scanned microfilm digitized into, you know, digital quality, um, the quality can be a little bit sketchy at times. So sometimes it's hard to read um, the text that's on there. Um, most slides, I've highlighted some key details that I talk about. Um, or if it's a really long article, I summarize it with bullet points. Um, I don't expect you to be able to read like the, the when there's an you know part of an article on a on a slide. I don't expect you to read the whole thing. Um, we honestly wouldn't have time for that. So um, I will act as your guide and your narrator through this sometimes confusing story. Um, and then as a disclaimer, I just want you to know that uh, this is not a definitive or comprehensive accounting of events. Um, there are holes and loose ends. There are definitely some unanswered questions. Okay, so I really would have loved to have interviews with people um, about this. That was one of our original ideas, but we just didn't have the time and resources to devote to it. Um, partly because there are some kind of local urban legends that have grown up about the story of uh, about William Brookshire. And, um, you know, that's fascinating in itself. I think it's, it would just be a great um, bit of, you know, oral history that somebody could do at some point. Also, there are people that have, you know, have recollections of him and had firsthand encounters with him. And I have um, had the pleasure of hearing one of those stories here, here at the library from one of our local uh, patrons, and I wanted to share it with you. Um, basically, this uh, library patron used to work at a gas station, and uh, William Brookshire was a kind of regular customer there. And, you know, back then you couldn't, you couldn't pump your own gas. That wasn't a thing. So he would be part of his job was to go out there and fill up the car with gas. And there were two things about him. Uh, one was that he always had a revolver setting on the passenger side of his car. Um, and then the other thing was that he wouldn't, he was notorious for not paying for his gas. He would drive off without paying for his gas, so much so that the owner of the gas station refused to ever go out there after a while and fill up William Brookshire's um, car with gas. So um, basically, I wanted to introduce that as a way to, um, as this quote from Anton Chekhov, which is very famous and overused, um, talks about introducing a, a pistol in the beginning of a story. And I just want to draw your attention to the fact that I have indeed introduced a pistol in the story. Um, I looked a little bit on social media to see what sort of stories that were um, talking about this. And this is from a Facebook group, public Facebook group called, you know, you're from Columbia when, where somebody asks about this serial killer that lived on Highway 63 South, it says he used to pick up hitchhikers, give them a job, then kill them. Um, a little further down, someone responds and says they never found his missing wife, may have, may have been at the bottom of that pond, and a little lower down, the housekeeper went missing also. Um, and this goes on for quite a while, and, and there's, there's a lot of interesting speculation and rumors. Um, here's another page, a Reddit page. This is uh, no sleep, so the subject of this is basically people share scary personal stories. And this one is someone is talking about their mother supposedly lived in the house 30 years ago. Um, and they say, you know, there was a man named William Brookshire he used to pick up transients and homeless people and tell them they could work on his land and he would kill them and bury them on his land. Rumors had it that he murdered and buried people on his land, but the only actual municipal case was when he allegedly killed a big logger by the name of Roderick Ness in self-defense. 
he had some odd 43 cattle die and one day due to weird circumstances such as poison and malnutrition. Um, a little further down, it says during his time in prison, so he was found guilty of one murder. This is the story says it estimated that more than 10 people had also been killed and buried on his land. Now I can tell you, I've found some stuff to confirm some of this. Um, I've also found not found anything to confirm some of the other stuff. I'm not going to tell you what right now we can that's part of the process of walking through this, but um, I think this is just an important time for me to give you the friendly reminder that not everything you find on the internet is true. So why is everybody talking about this guy? Well, it starts, I think, on May 1959. Uh, this quote here under the picture is, uh, I think it sets the tone in a very true crime sort of fashion. This modest looking farmhouse on Highway 63, about three miles north of Ashland, held death early Monday for Ralph G. Collings, a middle-aged transient worker from St. Louis. Um, a few more details in the beginning paragraphs. W.A. Brookshire, a Boone County attorney and livestock farmer, faces first-degree murder charge as a result of the shooting of an itinerant laborer Monday morning at Brookshire's farm south of Columbia. A formal first-degree murder charge was filed against the former state senator from Farmington, by Boone County Prosecutor Larry Woods late Monday afternoon. So who was William Albert Brookshire? He worked as a school teacher and superintendent. He graduated from the Chicago School of Law in 1919. He worked as an attorney based in Farmington, Missouri. He was the state senator for the 26th district from 1922 to 1926. And he moved to Boone County sometime around 1949. That date is not I don't know, I've seen two, there was like two conflicting stories. One said it was, it was written in 19, the, the article was from 1959, said that he had moved to Bloom County 10 years prior, but then there was another article around the same time that said it had been a longer period of time. So it's not clear exactly when, I'm, we might have been able to track that down and confirm it if we had the time. Um, so this is a page from the official manual of the state of Missouri for 1923 to 1924. There's a list of some of the legislative branch. Uh, there he is. About third paragraph down. Here is a easier to read copy of that. Um, so it mentions some of the stuff we already talked about. He graduated from Chicago School of Law, worked on a farm, taught in country schools. Um, he was a high school superintendent for six years. I mentioned he got married in May of 1914. Um, meant practices law in Farmington. Then it discusses some of the committees he's on. Um, the first one on mines and mining is kind of significant because I think Farmington was considered part of the lead belt. And uh, something else I read mentioned that a lot of his legal cases were involved in that industry. Uh, here's a copy of his marriage license with married, married Nora May Nichols on May 6th of 1914. Uh, it's pretty hard to read the six there, but that is, I'll take their word for it that that is a six. Uh, here's a page from a University of Chicago Law School, like a bulletin. He is listed over here, underlined in red, as a second-year law student in 1919. Now, here's a kind of strange story that turns, unfortunately, tragic. Um, but this is a, a note from the Houston Herald of Houston, Missouri, that mentions uh, Mrs. Clarence McCaskill entertaining uh, with a lawn social Thursday afternoon. Uh, the guest was Mrs. Albert Brookshire. I mentioned that Mrs. Brookshire and daughter Bernice left Sunday for looking to visit the relatives there. I'm pretty sure that this, they have to be related to uh, Senator Claire McCaskill, US, former U.S. Senator. I know that her father was from Houston and worked at a McCaskill, like I think Crane Mill. So I'm not, I almost want to say that's her grandparents, but I'm not positive, but most likely related. Sadly, the very next day, their daughter dies of, uh, it says here somewhere, parentitis um, was less, was not quite two years old. So that is uh, pretty awful. There's the death certificate, there's the obituary. Um, and moving on to 1920, he runs for prosecuting attorney of Iron County. One detail in here that I hadn't seen anywhere else, it says he was a student in Columbia. Um, at, I guess at the MU Law School. So I don't know if he went there and transferred to University of Chicago Law School. I don't know if that's actually not correct. 
I didn't go try digging to find confirmation that he attended uh, MU at any point. Um, then in 1922, he runs for state Senate. This article has some pretty interesting details, it mentions he's 31 years old. Uh, there's a few more things about his teaching and education that we already covered. Um, he uh, operates as a small dairy in addition to his law practice. He's described as probably the youngest Democratic nominee for state Senate, but by no means lacking in his ability. A reporter for the call had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Brookshire during the convention and found him to be that type of young man in which the world cannot have too many. There's a number of places, especially early on, where I highlight praise and where people compliment his character because in retrospect, it makes you wonder what happened to him. Like what was, what sort of decline occurred or was he always, you know, not, not quite right, but it just, he was a good job putting, making this veneer of having it together more than he did. Uh, we can only speculate. Um, this is an op-ed he wrote as a candidate to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. It's basically in response to a questionnaire that um, the paper had given to people at the state democratic convention about um, their support or opposition to uh, joining the League of Nations, which Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson uh, wanted to start after um, World War I. And uh, he says he does support it. And you know that later went on to become the United Nations. So he wins the election, and here is a picture of the young senator from the official state manual. Um, we didn't get into his uh, voting record, but there are some articles that discuss some of the some of his activities in the legislature. Uh, this one, he introduced a bill providing for a creation of a state fire marshal. He introduced a bill for the establishment of a board of censors for the movies. Um, there's, it, this one here about the gasoline tax fund mentions that he was a co-sponsor and, um, but his interest in it seemed to have waned and there was some question about whether or not the bill was gonna pass. Perhaps the most exciting thing involves um, some finances with the state. I'm gonna just read this paragraph. The state of Missouri stands to lose something like $125,000 through the failure of the Holland Bank at Springfield. This is the estimate of the Brookshire Senate Committee, which was appointed to investigate the condition of the state's deposits and defunct banks. The committee's explanation in the report it is preparing fixes responsibility for this liability on former Governor Hyde, former Attorney General Barrett, and Auditor Thompson. Uh, this other article over here says similar, similar things where he says that the state officers were, guilt, were guilty of gross carelessness and indifference in the acceptance of the securities given to guard the state funds and that the loss to the state would exceed $100,000. This prompted a rather lengthy, as you can see, rather lengthy reply from the state treasurer. Um, this is in the Douglas County Herald, Ava. Um, I won't go into all the details of that, but there are these two paragraphs where the state treasurer uh, specifically mentions Mr. Brookshire, and they are kind of hard to read. Um, it says, this statement of Mr. Brookshire's was a de deliberate misrepresentation as the testimony of Mr. Moody proves. And then in the second paragraph at that one at the bottom asks for Mr. Brook Mr. Brookshire, I have only this to say to him, that as he grows older, he will find that fairness and honesty are much the best policy and that in seeking publicity, it is the best to choose these things, which will not prove a boomerang. So. Is that foreshadowing about his character or is that just simply politicians being politicians? I don't know. Um, then in 1926, he ran for re-election. Here is the name and the Democratic ticket from the Perry County Sun. Um, here's a letter he wrote while he was running that has running for re-election. It has um, one significant detail that hadn't come across before was that he was in a serious automobile accident. So as it says here, within the, the past few days, rumor has been current that I contemplated withdrawing from the campaign for state senator for this district. I think it is quite generally known that I was very seriously injured in an automobile collision on the 16th of June, 1926, from which I have not fully recovered. And the financial loss I sustained caused me to thoughtfully consider the advisability of accepting the nomination for state senator. He does, however, accept it. And um, in this article, he kind of goes on about some of his um, 
stances that he has on certain issues, uh, some of the legislation he worked for. Um, I highlighted a few that just frankly, because they seem ironic in retrospect. Uh, this one here, I'm in favor of limiting very materially the number of laws and then in actually, in actually enforcing each and every law on the state books. Um, that is funny because as it will become apparent later, he is involved in a lot of lawsuits. Um, and then here, there's a couple that are a sort of stuff, tough on crime sort of stance. If I am reelected to the state Senate, I shall favor the enactment of laws that make it easier for criminals to be convicted, yet laws that safeguard the rights of the innocent. And the, the rights and liberties of every citizen must be such that the wrongdoer can be easily and effectively punished. I'm in favor of restricting the power of courts and executives to pardon and parole men who have been legally convicted of a crime. Um, he ends up losing the re-election by uh, 622 votes. Then in 1928, there's another tragedy involving another daughter who at this time dies at eight years old. Um, this is the obituary. There's no cause of death listed. Um, in 1934, he tries to run for Senate again. This time he's trying to get the Democratic nomination. Um, here's another quote that praises him. The Senator, that Senator Brookshire is held in high esteem. Oh, this also, I forgot. This one also um, has some details about his career as a lawyer. Um, that he's held in high esteem by the State Bar Association is shown by the fact that he was elected second vice president of the association in 1927 and was elected a member of the Missouri Council of the American Bar Association. His honesty, honesty and integrity cannot be questioned. Uh, this is just a note from a newspaper in Fredericktown about his being on the campaign trail, making a stop. Um, he ends up losing the primary uh, by a as this says, a decisive majority of 1,600 votes. Then here we go to 1940, and there is an um, article about a trustee sale involving a default being made on, the, on a loan, essentially. And this is one of the first mentions I find of uh, financial problems, financial shenanigans, which come up quite a bit. Um, if you remember in the story I told in the beginning, he wasn't paying for his gas. So um, that seems to be a trait that, uh, I don't know, you'll just see it keeps, it keeps coming up. Uh, we know that he divorced, he and his wife got divorced at some point, and we found this uh, mentioned from the Tri-City Independent of Festus, Missouri from 1943. They are both listed on the civil docket, so it seems pretty likely that they got divorced, and if in, not in 1943, since this was December 30th, probably 1944. Yes, and then sometime around 1949, he moves to Boone County and buys that property. That's between Columbia and Ashland. Uh, here in 1958, we have a mention of some more legal troubles. This one is... Uh, some cases that involve pasturing and feeding of cattle. And I'm trying not to go into great detail on these sort of peripheral legal um, problems that he has or lawsuits that he initiates himself. Um, I'm sort of focusing on the, the ones that basically involve murder. Um, but I do want to mention them because it just shows the sort of confusing swirl of stuff that was happening. So this brings us back to May of 1959 and the shooting. Um, some more details from this article. After the shooting, Brookshire and the two other farmhands drove into Columbia where Brookshire picked up his mail and then called the sheriff's office. Brookshire claimed the shooting was in self-defense. He said he tried to fire Collings who then came after Brookshire with a hammer. Other farmhands confirmed Collings was carrying a hammer but said it was because he had been doing carpentry work. Although a little later, another farmhand testifies actually in court, says that Collings didn't have a hammer, so I'm not, that's a little fuzzy. Um, Collings was shot three times in the chest and once in the arm at close range with a 32 caliber pistol. So um, I want to read this top paragraph because there's a sort of chilling quote by Mr. Brookshire. The shooting was reported by Brookshire to the Boone County Sheriff's Office at about 10.10 a.m. by telephone. 
Brookshire telephoned Deputy Sheriff Pearlie Lucard and told Lucard that he had a dead man in his house. I wanted to know if the sheriff wanted you to come by, quote, and take a look at it sometime today, end quote. It does not sound very phased about having just shot a man. Um, some more details from this article. Brookshire and Collins had argued all day, Sunday and Monday morning, about salary. Brookshire claimed to have tried to fire Collins several times before. He claimed Collins used the hammer to break the kitchen door and enter the house. Uh, and then reporters who looked through the windows to the home described the house as a shambles. And over here, this highlighted part of the second paragraph down that describes the entire house was piled with trash and litter and rats were seen running across the floors. In the kitchen where blood was still evident on the floor, newspapers, broken bottles, empty cans, food wrappers, and other trash and garbage littered the floor. And here we have the death certificate for Mr. Collins. You can see the immediate cause of death is a massive hemorrhage due to lacerations of the aorta due to gunshot wounds and a deceased shot in chest with 32 caliber pistol. Um, the preliminary hearing apparently drug on for quite a while. Um, this describes a dinner at the bottom as the marathon hearing that began Friday morning. Um, this is on a Sunday. Um, and it's described state, state's evidence ends of the hearing. Um, and then where does it say? Yeah, it appeared that, oops, sorry about that. It appeared that um, it would drag on into another day and perhaps two. Uh, kind of exciting little bit of courtroom drum around here in this lower paragraph where Brookshire created some commotion when he tried to question Luke Hart after the deputy sheriff had left the stand. He then asked and received a recess in the hearing until this afternoon. So he's eventually charged with first degree murder and released on a $15,000 bond, which seemed kind of low to me. But more importantly, I wouldn't draw your attention to this over here in the corner. Breakfast special, two pancakes, butter and syrup, two sausage patties, 39 cents. That is quite the deal. And I am still blown away by this every time I look at it. That is a hearty breakfast for 39 cents. Can't even get anything approaching that now. Um, and, you know, I thought the $15,000 bond seemed low for first degree murder, but now that I see that, I see $15,000 can buy you, could have bought you a lot of pancakes in 1959, so maybe it makes sense. Um, and so he responds by suing. Um, so I'll just read this whole thing here. This is from July 4th, 1959, so that's two months roughly after the um, after the shooting, Brookshire, who had been charged with the killing, alleged he was falsely arrested and asked $100,000 actual and $100,000 punitive damage against investigating coroner Vincent P. Perna, Deputy Sheriff Pearlie Lucart, and a former deputy, Theron Duncan. In the suit, Brookshire said he notified the sheriff's office about the death of Collins, but the three defendants, instead of asking him to help them in the investigation, imprisoned him. I have to pause because that part to me is just the, one of the craziest things is that he, I guess, expected by calling the sheriff that about a shooting he was involved with that they would ask him to help them in their investigating investigation of the shooting he was involved with. That seems like an unrealistic expectation in my book. I don't know. Um, he charges that he was in prison without a warrant. He further alleged that the three men agreed among themselves before arriving at his home on the morning of Collins' death to arrest him so that they might plunder his home and obtain evidence. There is a lot of stuff where he seems to feel not fairly treated in Boone County. He feels almost like there's a conspiracy against him, which I think that right there sounds like a conspiracy. Um, this comes up over and over. Um, here's one of the side... Um, legal problems that he's also encountering while all this more serious stuff is going on. In this case, it's a charge of driving an unregistered vehicle. Um, and there's a series of three articles that just discuss, um, one, the trial being moved to Cole County at Brookshire's request. Um, says here, the case will be tried here on a change of venue. This is from the Daily Capital News, Jeff City. Uh, we, um, tried on a change of venue from Boone County Circuit Court, which was granted last month. Um, it also mentions that 
the daughter of Mr. Collings, the person who was shot, filed a civil suit against him. Uh, it also mentions he was vindicated in yet another um, lawsuit inv involving insufficient funds um, from a check. Um, and this I just thought was kind of funny where either he had an arraignment, but it was moved. The arraignment was scheduled for a Thursday, but Brookshire, a lawyer, told Boone County Prosecutor Larry Woods he had to handle a case in Iowa. So I guess he was traveling to Iowa to still be a lawyer in the midst of all this. Uh, and then the trial eventually is set for the week of April 11th, 1950. No, I'm sorry, 1960. Uh, and then another strange development in January of 1960, he says he was attacked by two men who he was bringing from Kansas City to work on his farm. So he drove to Kansas City to find two other itinerant workers to come bring back to his farm in Boone County to work. And they um, apparently attacked him and robbed him. It says here that Brookshire told the state highway patrol he was attacked by two men he had brought from Kansas City to work on his farm near Ashland. On the way to Sedalia, they struck him on the head, taking his car, about $15, and some checks. Um, here, you, Over here on the left, you can see there's a list. Uh, he's listed as one of the hospital admissions. And then the pair waive their hearing. They get, they're located in Kansas City, and they waive their preliminary hearing. I uh, don't hear anything more about that. Didn't come across anything more about that particular story, what happened with those guys. But it just seems strange that, you know, after shooting a guy, then he picks up more people and then they attack him. Um, so the trial begins, subpoenas are issued for 11 witnesses. Um, it was partly, there's a two week continuance so that um, Brookshire could take care of some personal matters and to interview unexpected witnesses. Then the trial gets delayed briefly because a lawyer helping Brookshire um, is sick. And it's kind of interesting because Brookshire said he was relying on the attorney, Paul Allen of Jefferson City, to help him select the jury. It seems that he has a lawyer in a lot of these cases, but he is also acting as his own lawyer. It seems like there are times when he's even questioning witnesses, um, even though he has an attorney helping him. Okay, now we get to a sort of lengthy courtroom drama here. This describes an itinerant laborer that comes up to the witness stand and you know says that Ralph Collins did in fact threaten Mr. Brookshire. Um, so it says here the Beavers testified today that Collins and Brookshire were arguing that Monday and Brookshire ordered Collins off the premises. Um, it was a conversation that Beavers said he heard. I told you to get out of my house, Brookshire said. I will when you pay me, Collins answered. I don't owe you anything, Brookshire replied. Brookshire then called in Beavers and another farmhand and asked them to sign a note on an envelope which said he had heard Brookshire order Collins out of the house. Apparently, Collins told the two farmhands, you fellas better get out of here, but there's going to be trouble. Then there's this description of how um, Collins runs, runs around the back of the house and in through the rear porch, a racket follows. And Beaver says he heard furniture, chairs, and tin cans being turned over. Then a series of shots rang out and everything was quiet. Um, then 10 minutes later, Brookshire calls Beavers and the other handyman into the, into the house. Oops, I didn't mean to do that again. Uh, Brookshire showed his wrist and said, he tried to hit me with a hammer, Beaver said. The mark was red about the size of a dime and looked like a mosquito bite. Oh, and the body was lying on the kitchen floor. Um, then it goes into a little bit more about the court. Um, apparently, both the prosecuting attorney and defending attorney tried on the shirt that Collins was wearing to show the bullet holes. Um, there seemed to be some argument about whether or not some of the holes would have been made if Collins' arm was raised with a hammer as if he was attacking Brookshire or as if the holes would have been there if the, his arm was down by his side. And basically the prosecutor says the arm was raised and the defense is trying to make the case that the um, his arm was at his side. Or no, sorry, I got that backwards. The defense is trying to argue that the arm was raised because um, Brookshire said he did it in self-defense. Uh, ballistics tests showed that five slugs involved in the crime were fired from a pistol investigators found in a small dresser in an upstairs bedroom. Um, 
this also then again it talks about how the kitchen was strewn with newspapers and glass um there's an interesting detail here that says brookshire would not give any information on the death at that time brookshire demanded a hearing so it gets near deliberation um there's some points of conflicting evidence according to this article that appear during the cross examination, excuse me. Uh, Brookshire said he saw Collins with a hammer outside of the house, but Beavers testified he had no hammer. So that conflicts the previous article that maybe he had a hammer, but he was using it for carpentry. Um, and then eventually he is found guilty. It says here, he's found guilty of manslaughter and that the recommendation was a three-year sentence in a state penitentiary. Uh, this describes, this article from the Sunday News Tribune describes that moment. It says the jury reached its decision at 6.18 p.m. Brookshire fumbled nervously with a set of car keys as he awaited the verdict read by Guy Sum, circuit clerk. As soon as the verdict was read, Brookshire jumped up from the defense table and followed Judge Sam C. Blair into his chamber. He asked for 30 days to file a motion for a new trial. It was granted. Um, oh, and then while that's going on, he gets a little, he has an injunction uh, concerning basically trying to take away his license and registration. Um, so he has a plea, a, a plea and for a new trial, and it is refused. Um, even though the trial had been moved to Cole County at his request, he then argued that he was entitled to a new trial because of prejudicial errors. He accuses the prosecuting attorney of getting a witness to perjure themselves, and he is eventually granted a reduced bond of $5,000 to assure his freedom while he worked on an appeal to the state Supreme Court. And then he shoots another hired farmhand in his home. This time, uh, also with a 32 caliber pistol, I don't know if it's the same gun. You'd think that that would have been taken in as evidence, but I'm not sure if <clears throat> maybe that wasn't standard practice then. So as it said, he shot to death his second hired hand since May 1959. This victim was Roderick J. Neese, 45, of Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, niece and another hired farmhand had been working for Brookshire. Oh, I'm sorry, another hired farmhand had been working for Brookshire for two weeks. Brookshire claimed Niece had been drinking. They quarreled at dinner, and Niece refused to leave the table after dinner was over. Brookshire claimed Niece threatened him with a knife and bragged of having cut other people. Brookshire was quoted as saying, I thought he had a knife as he was threatening to cut my guts out. Brookshire said he shot Niece after being chased up the stairs by the farmhand. Niece's body was found at the foot of the stairs. Niece was wearing two pairs of pants, and there's a pocket knife was found inside the pocket of the inner pair of pants. So if he had a knife, it would have been hard to get to. And here is the death certificate for Mr. Niece, uh, immediate cause, gunshot wound in the head. Here's a picture from the Kansas City Star from around that time that shows his kitchen and it is indeed in quite a state of, uh, I think shambles was the word used in that earlier article. It's of newspapers and trash about it. Uh, so here's a quote from the St. Louis Globe Democrat. I just pulled a couple out of here, partly because this is once again, Brookshire seeming to be very blase about shooting someone. Um, Sheriff Glenn Powell said Brookshire called him about 8.30 Wednesday night and said, quote, I had to shoot a man, end quote. Um, this also mentions some of his other legal problems, how he was involved in a hassle over purchase of his farm on Highway 63. He bid $10,000 for the property at a sheriff's sale, but refused to pay more than $700, the $700 necessary to satisfy the judgment on which the land was sold. Um, so there's just all sorts of problems like that going on with him. Uh, this kind of long article from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch gets a pretty good profile of him up to this point, at least. A um, few quotes. As a tempest has stormed around him, his life here, which is in Boone County, has been a succession of battles with Boone County. 
He has, had, he has had a quarrel with his neighbors from the outset 14 years ago over fences and grazing land. Even Brookshire is hazy about how many of his cases are pending. And I could say, like, going through these articles, trying to figure out what happened with the murders, there's all these other little court cases getting mentioned in trials that it's it was it was kind of a bit of a chore to, like, piece it all together and, and get it in a put it together in a way that made sense, I guess. I hope it makes sense. Um, his neighbors rarely see him out of court. Brookshire is a man surrounded by fences. He says he wants it that way. I'm a lone wolf, he told a reporter at the sheriff's office. I came here and I didn't associate with people. They couldn't understand it, so they ganged up on me. I had an idea when I came here I'd raise cattle and write a book on American government, but I had so many lawsuits, I never got started on the book. Um, it says here he reviews Woods, who's the prosecuting attorney, Larry Woods, and practically everyone else in the county is being prejudiced against him. County say he sees personal antipathy where there is none intended. And then it does this partial list of his cases that are going on. So there's uh, convicted of paying his county taxes with a check that later returned because of insufficient funds. Um, twice in 1957, he, his farm was sold at sheriff's auctions to satisfy unpaid judgments. Um, there's a mention again of the daughter of Collins who um, brought a lawsuit against him and she apparently was awarded $17,000 for that. Um, and here, this you might remember earlier on in that Reddit page, someone mentioned dead cattle, said when neighbors reported seeing some of Brookshire's cattle dead in the pasture last summer, which charged him with mistreating cattle by allowing them to starve to death. Uh, then the Missouri Highway Control, Highway, sorry, Highway Patrol complained about Brookshire's driving habits. He refused to request that he take a driver's examination and they revoked his license. And pending since May 1959 is a $200,000 rival suit filed by Brookshire against the Columbia Daily Tribune and six individuals, including two sheriff's deputies. Um, here it says a strange metamorphosis has taken place in Brookshire since he came here from Farmington. Persons who knew him years ago say, once was popular. He was a terrific country lawyer. One man knew him well in Farmington and asserted, we, we called him the Senator. He was popular with, peop with the people, influential in politics and a marvelous speaker. And he was a rough and tumble character in the courtroom. He was just about the best attorney in that part of the country. And then over here, these last couple of paragraphs, Brookshire blames the townsfolk for tarnishing and destroying his dream. And the only show of emotion he permitted himself in an hour's conversation, he murmured wistfully, I should not have come here. I would have been better off if I had stayed in Farmington. So he clearly sees the county itself and the people there as being partly responsible for his situation. Um, so the autopsy results for Nice um, are released and they contradict some of the, at least the initial assumptions um, and seem to contradict Brookshire's version of events. So over here, it mentions that he's been, um, niece had been shot in the back of the head instead of in the forehead as investigators first announced. The coroner said that a forehead wound at first believed to have been the cause of death was probably incurred in a fall on a stairway after niece had been shot. Um, and then over here on the right, there's a er, article earlier from November 11th that um, has Brookshire quoted as saying, niece got up and started after me. Mr. Neese said, I'm going to finish you, Brookshire related, and Brookshire ran to the stairway, turned and fired one shot. And you would think if he was coming towards him and he shot him, it would not have been in the back, back of the head. Uh, then he voluntarily consents to enter the state, the state mental hospital in Fulton for observation and treatment. Um, the prosecutor Woods said that the move was a non-judicial procedure whereby Brookshire would be admitted to the hospital on his own initiative. So this was uh, November 17th of 1960. Then on December 1st, 1960, he was declared sane and returned to Columbia to stand trial. Um, here's a few more lawsuits, uh, libel actions filed. He sues the Jefferson City uh, News Tribune Company and its managing editor for uh, $10,000 actual and $50,000 punitive damages. Um, He's charged that he was liable last year in connection with his trial on charges of killing his farmhand, Ralph G. Collins. Um, here we have some state rebuttals on the uh, murder case, and it ends. So 
one rebuttal witness uh, said that he was um, reporter for the Tribune. He said he was misquoted uh, for something about Berkshire as reputation. Um, the state had introduced a parade of 11 witnesses who testified that Brookshire's reputation for truth and veracity in the community in which he lives is bad. Um, the defense argued that they weren't good witnesses because most of them um, were living in Columbia and Boone County, and he was had a number of legal problems with people there. Um, On cross-examining uh, the witnesses, uh, Brookshire's character obtained admissions that most of what they had done was trouble with Brookshire and the lawyer defendant was suing a number of them. So essentially arguing because he was suing them, they shouldn't be witnesses. Oh, and this here it mentions that um, Brookshire has helped um, represent the defense for himself. He is then found guilty. This is from June 29th, 1961. Uh, found guilty of second degree murder. And uh, he transplants the motion for a new trial. And the appeal, while this is going on, the appeal is still pending for the Ralph Collins murder. Um, it says he made a uh, 20 minute, 20 minute plea to the jury charging the prosecution engaged in a guessing game of trial. And he has 40 days to which he can um, file a motion for a new trial. Um, and one of his smaller legal complications um, involving um, losing his, trying to hang on to his driver's license, I believe, um, the judge gets disqualified. So he has a small victory there. Um, oops. Um, so his conviction is upheld. So he loses his appeal to the state Supreme Court manslaughter case. This is for the first um, murder of Ralph G. Collins. And as it says up here, still pending before the Supreme Court or an appeal from the, for a second degree murder conviction in the killing of another farmhand, Roger G. Mace. So he took both of these cases to the state Supreme Court. Um, so then he enters the state penitentiary. Um, a lot of his other cases, it gets, uh, they sort of get put on hold because they're not sure how to proceed now that he's been gone to prison. Um, like they actually had a circuit judge here. It says circuit judge uh, G. Derek Green was recently assigned to the 19th Judicial Circuit as a special judge to hear certain cases involving Brookshire. Um, then there's questions about who's going to pay. Uh, part of this stems from the fact that he asked for a change to go to Cole County. And so it's, you know, this is partly the Boone County prosecutor trying to get um, money back for the costs and they want to get it partly from the bond that he had to put up. Um, then here's some of his property being sold off. Um, long list of his cattle that were owned by him. Um, and it mentions here, I believe, the, the trustee that's been assigned to his estate is named George C. Miller. Uh, and then um, the Missouri Bar wants to disbar him. Um, it's a pretty good quote here at the beginning of this article. I realize I am appearing as a convict, former state W.A. Bookshar told the Missouri Supreme Court in the disbarment hearing. And he later says, I'd rather be a dead man as a convict, Bookshar told the court. Contended, contended all along that I committed no crime. He also apparently repeatedly demanded that the Supreme Court tell him the name of the person who wrote an opinion upholding his manslaughter conviction. And I think the Chief Justice told him that it was the opinion of the entire court. And this gets into some of his um, other litigations, like eight civil suits on the Friday docket. Seven, several thousand dollars are asked by Brookshire in cases against the Exchange National Bank, News Tribune Company, Paul Wolfram, L.L. McDowell. Um, the suits involve claims ranging from libel to cattle purchase disputes and ask actual as well as punitive damages. Uh, then the trustee for the estate of William W.I. Brookshire has been given 90 days to decide if there will be further litigation in seven civil lawsuits filed by Brookshire, totaling $385,000. Um, 
and then he is disbarred. This is March 7th, 1962. So he turns to the Supreme Court, saying the US Supreme Court in this case, not the state Supreme Court. Um, he informed the circuit court of his decision and asked for an order to obtain custody of the transcript and files of his Missouri Supreme Court appeal. Um, this is, I believe, all uh, concerning the first shooting. Uh, then he is denied a supply of law books in his cell. Uh, they, the court didn't give much of a reason, but just that his permission to provide the use law books is stricken from the docket. Then um, the Supreme Court resets, this is the state Supreme Court resets his hearing. This would be about the second shooting of Nice. Then he gets his chance to argue his case before the Supreme Court. He calls it an act of self-defense. Um, Pretty good quote from him in this article from the Kansas City Times. Um, W.A. Brookshire of Ashland, excuse me, yesterday asked the Missouri Supreme Court to decide if a man should wait until his, quote, insides are cut out before defending himself against the threats of another man. He delivered a 40 minute oral argument in his appeal. Um, the assistant attorney general argued it was the general rule in case law that physical violence must occur before a man may kill in self-defense. And a lot of the argument was surrounded whether or not Nice was shot in the forehead or in the back of the skull. Um, Brookshire claimed that the coroner who invested in the case originally found the fatal bullet and entered from the front, had entered from the front, but later changed his testimony. But really what it seems to have, what has happened is that the um, investigators that had showed up on the scene thought that the initial wound was in the front of the head, but the coroner found that that was from falling face first in the stairs. And that the bullet wound, actually the bullet actually entered the back of the head. Uh, then he is punished for a cluttered cell. Um, this paragraph down here towards the bottom says employees cleaned out the cell once, but within two weeks it was worse than ever. Once a small fire was discovered in the debris. So seems to be a bit of a order even in prison. Um, and then there's another strange wrinkle of the story. Um, this involves Warren Hearns running for governor. Um, so there's this long article about him, uh, you know, campaigning essentially. Uh, but then something comes up involving W.A. Brookshire, and that is one reporter asked the candidate uh, and Secretary of State whether he planned to make an issue of Lieutenant Governor Bush's commutation of the sentence of W.A. Brookshire in his campaign. Um, and so the background of this is that if you look down here at the bottom, it's on October 22nd, 1963, Hillary A. Bush, he was acting and Lieutenant Governor, signed an order commuting a three-year sentence of W.A. Brookshire. Um, so he was acting governor, and for some reason he signed a order commuting him. The sentence, the first sentence for Albert Collins, or yeah. Um, however, there was a hold on order on Brookshire on a 10 year sentence, that would be the Nice shooting, um, also for manslaughter, therefore he was never released. Um, Bush was acting governor for three days, and then what significance the commutation of that part of his prison term may have has never been made clear. So, strange circumstances, he was almost pardoned for at least the first murder. Um, and then the, the trail runs kind of cold. We don't know much about what happened to him after that, except he reportedly served his two sentences, um, and the Rumor is he ended up in Fulton State Hospital for the rest of his life. If you see his, um, the date he died was 1981. That would have made him about 93 years old. Um, he is buried in a cemetery in Licking, Missouri, where his ex-wife and his daughters are buried, but he's not buried with them per se. He doesn't have a headstone. He has a um, little metal marker. Um, we weren't able to find an obituary for him, it's not to say there isn't one out there, you know, if you maybe went down to like Licking, Missouri and looked through microfilm um, of, of their paper, something might turn up. Uh, and like, as I said, he, as far as we know, he served out the rest of his days in the Fulton State Hospital. So that is 
the end of the story, as far as we could piece it together, there are probably missing pieces. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for um, joining me. Brought to you by the Daniel Boone Regional Library.